Metricast. What up, and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris, and I'm here with my older brother. Wesley, hey. And today, we are talking about Best Motion Picture, Musical or Comedy nominee, and Oscar Overlooked, Dolomite Is My Name. Wes? So we have to specify that Best Picture, Musical or Comedy is for the Golden Globes, not for the Oscars, for which this movie received nothing. Nothing. Totally snubbed. Yep. Although, is it a snub if it is not necessarily awards worthy? No, it is not a snub if the movie is not not Oscar worthy. And plus, I don't think this movie was necessarily made for awards. Right. It's not that Dolomite wasn't made for awards, and it's not like it wasn't necessarily deserving of its nomination, Golden Globe nomination, but I think that this was more of a passion project for Eddie Murphy. A friend's project. I think that he got a bunch of people together. He liked this story. I read that Keegan-Michael Key is a was a longtime Dolomite fan, even before this project was announced. And I think that Eddie Murphy approached him and he was super happy to be a part of it, as I'm sure they all were. Seems like when Eddie Murphy finds a movie that he wants to make, he surrounds himself with his friends and they have a good time making it. And that was not only the case for this film off screen, but also on screen. Eddie Murphy getting friends together to make a film about friends getting together to make a film. Mm -hmm. Although it's also the story of Dolomite, who is a, is a, is a factual character. Yes, we're talking about Emperor Dolomite of the Crimean Wars, who invaded Sicily in the 1930s. The dude who made up the character Dolomite is an actual dude. Rudy Ray Moore, uh, the actor, came up with the character Dolomite, yeah, in the 70s, and made, I think, seven movies. I think it's interesting that you say Rudy Ray Moore came up with the character Dolomite, considering in the film they make it clear that he plagiarized the character from a homeless man who was never repaid for his creation. In this movie, Eddie Murphy as Rudy Ray Moore seemed to make no secret about the fact that he wanted these stories and he wanted to get them on tape and he had hooch and a few dollars in recompense. Oh, I see. So he did pay him at the time. I have to assume so. At least the movie made it look that way. And as long as he's going to go into the back alley and ask the uh, homeless guy about his characters and, and put it on tape, uh, that probably was the way to uh, to get that done. Okay, so I watched Dolomite when I was sick, but it, it afforded me this unique opportunity to actually do like a little bit of research. And I was such a it was so weird. It was such a contrast to see Eddie Murphy talking with Stephen Colbert versus Eddie Murphy as Rudy Ray Moore as Dolomite. So the thing about Eddie Murphy's performance in Dolomite is he was very Eddie Murphy. I thought. And I think I see that shtick as being who Eddie Murphy actually is. And then when I see him in an interview, he's very reserved or he's just very um, contained. Yes, and I can't help but feel that Eddie Murphy has become more reserved over the years. Um, he's been tempered sort of by by his career over the last uh, you know thirty years, thirty plus years. There have been a lot of ups and downs, and I think that he's more cautious and reserved. Uh, than he was, and certain, certainly he's older. For example, he appeared, he recently hosted Saturday Night Live. Really? And yes, for the first time in decades. Uh, the last time he appeared on Saturday Night Live was for, I think, the 40th anniversary, 40th, 45th anniversary um, show, where they finally convinced him to appear. He had had a falling out, falling out, and he did agree to appear, said nothing funny, barely smiled, didn't do any characters, any kind of voices. He was just, he came out and said how much he owed Saturday Night Live, uh, how much he appreciated being there. And in the talk shows, it's almost like as, as though he doesn't really have anything to prove. And so he just sort of is who he is, which I find kind of refreshing. It is a vast difference, uh, as I guess you would find with most comedians, right? Yeah, it is. It's, a, it's not what I expected. I mean, I grew up watching Eddie Murphy. We grew up watching Eddie Murphy. I think I've seen Eddie Murphy's Raw or Delirious more than I have kind of any other content in De my life. Definitely Raw for me. I mean, how many times do you think you've seen that in your life? Maybe 10, 12 times. I mean, yeah. I, I would say probably the same for me, if not more. I grew up watching Eddie Murphy. I love Eddie Murphy. I thought that Eddie Murphy's um, appearance on the Colbert show was a performance. I thought that because he starts off very reserved, but you could tell as Stephen Colbert is trying to get things out of him and warm up, warm him up, that he does warm up. 
and that he does become more of his kind of, um, I don't know, his Eddie Murphy persona that we know and we love. And so I kind of feel like it's, it's something that he intends to do, but it is actually a little counter to who he is. Yes, but there's, a, there's another aspect to that dynamic that I didn't want to lose track of, and that's that you went, I thought the direction you were going was when you said that this movie was very Eddie Murphy, or he was very Eddie Murphy in this movie, that Dolomite, or the Rudy Ray Moore character that he portrays, and Dolomite, are very Eddie Murphy. They are very Eddie Murphy, raw, sort of early 80s Eddie Murphy, or in this case, what Eddie Murphy would have been like in the 70s. Exactly. If he had been that age. And that's hard to disassociate from. It's hard to see him as a character other than who he is. I think it bears noting that in this movie, none of the people, I assume a lot of them are, are actual people. I know Rudy Ray Moore was. I know the director of Dolomite was. Didn't look anything like their characters whatsoever. Uh, particularly Eddie Murphy, as you saw from the end credits of Dolomite, they show the actual clips from the actual film. He looks nothing like Rudy Ray Moore. Uh, he was about 12 years older than Rudy Ray Moore, which doesn't matter because Eddie Murphy doesn't age, and he will be able to slide right back into coming to America as though he never left. Oh my God, I can't wait. Wesley Snipes, as the director of uh, of Dolomite, Wesley Snipes, the actor, is 20 plus years older than the actual guy. They weren't shooting for authenticity here. Right. They were just a bunch of guys. Let's get the friends together. Let's make a movie that we think is fun and is funny. Got it. And so I don't know that they were. A, striving for a level of realism and in that did he need to portray Rudy Ray Moore to a T or could he be Eddie Murphy and be loved you know which is not a stretch which is it's easy to see yeah let's talk a little bit about this cast because we've got some pretty big names I don't know if they're all friends maybe you do Eddie Murphy Keegan Michael Key I mean Mike Epps Wesley Snipes I mean Craig Robinson this is like pretty fun cast. It is a really fun cast. I don't recall ever seeing any of those people working together specifically that I can recall. I mean, I thought that Craig Robinson was really well cast. He's very music musical. Um, I did a web series with him once, and on set he entertained everybody by seeing the most beautiful version of Five Dollar Footlongs you've ever heard. <laughs> He's awesome. <laughs> what web series was that? Oh, well, funny that you should ask. It was called PG Porn. Who directed that? James Gunn. James Gunn of Guardians of the Galaxy fame? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty big names. Well, you know, I only have to just happened to produce a couple films with him. So anyway, um, I also am a big Mike Epps fan, although my experience with him is rather limited to my favorite movie of all time. The Hangover. Exactly. He was the black Doug in Hangover. Was There was a white Doug, right? Doug Doug on the roof was white Doug. Yep. Okay. Because <laughs> you can't just be Black Doug in absence of a White Doug. That's right. Or an Asian Doug, or whatever. There can be multiple Dougs. Okay. We've got the Asian Doug. <laughs> we do. That's Dad. <laughs> anyway, I think it's kind of hard for me to talk about the actual content, like the story, what was moving about this film, and I'm not really sure why. I get that Rudy Ray Moore is an inspirational character, and although his, um, his thing, you know, his passion was rather unorthodox, he is a testament to like, you know, doing it yourself and like doing what you do and believing in what you do. But for some reason I find it hard to articulate how that's manifest, made manifest in this film. I think that by the time the movie wraps up and Rudy is with his crowd all loving him instead of in the theater and just watching the screen, it his larger than life persona was on the screen, but his life persona, his relatability was on the ground with people um, having a good time and laughing and stirring the crowd up. I think it's obvious how loved he was from this movie. I'm not sure how well he was received in real life, but the arc his character achieves from being a relative nobody to, to somebody that people love and adore and seek out on this sort of grassroots marketing campaign was really effective. I think his character came a long way and that was evident. As to how far his character actually moved me, that's a different story. Obviously he was a big influence on uh, Keegan-Michael Key, who's in this movie, as well as Eddie Murphy, who want, really wanted to tell this story, a passion project as you said, but Rudy Ray Moore was never my thing. I had heard his name, but wasn't necessarily a fan. Well, you know why you haven't seen the original Dolomite? Why's that? Because it's not on Netflix. Not on. <laughs> I do seek out movies that I'm interested in seeing. Um, Dolomite seems like a movie that, that Dad would have tried to get me to watch growing up. That's but it so wasn't. True. No, it was more Cheech and Chong. 
So for whatever reason, if I have seen Dolomite, I don't remember it. Well, I just think it's rather ironic that Dolomite is a Netflix original film, and yet the original Dolomite is not on Netflix. It's one of Netflix's strengths, right? To have a movie and then surround it with ancillary stuff or the original material, because Netflix has that ability to just license everything and put it up in a way that nobody else does unless it was on a DVD extra or something. Right. It seems like the perfect format to be able to give you uh, content plus all the supplemental material you could possibly want. Right. So I'm not really sure what happening. What happened program wise. How badly do you want to see Dolomite? I mean, to be honest, after watching this and being sick and bedridden, I would have watched it. I feel... I was so sick that I would have been willing to watch this movie. I, I feel like I watched Dolomite by watching Dolomite as my name. I don't think they were all that different. Okay, so this brings up another important point, and that is I felt the same way after seeing Disaster Artist and Is Dolomite Is My Name the Black Disaster Artist? I didn't see The Room. Everybody's like, oh my god, it's so terrible, you should watch it. I don't watch movies that are terrible. Sometimes I watch movies and they end up being terrible. I'm certainly not going to seek out a terrible movie. Because I haven't seen The Room, I didn't watch Disaster Artist. I also haven't seen Dolomite, but the Golden Globes nominees, which don't mean anything, required that I watch Dolomite as my name. Not to say I wouldn't have watched it, because it came highly recommended from Lance, uh, who was also bedridden when he saw it. Uh, but I, it's, it, was, it wouldn't have been my first choice that I was seeking out. Was the eek face and the knitted brows because I said black disaster artist? Is that racist to say? I don't know what's racist anymore. By the time this podcast comes out, things will have changed probably and it will be racist. I don't think it's racist right now. But then again, <laughs> I'm a Japanese Mexican. <laughs> I have no idea. Can, can I, as a woman of color, say things like that and maybe have a little bit more of a pass? It's, it's, it's not a color, it's more of a tint. Still it counts. Yeah. So do you, you kind of get what I'm saying about how, like, I'm having a hard time articulating how I was moved? That's, I think it's because I wasn't moved. Mm. I had a good time watching the movie. It's this weird disconnect that I was, I've been trying to identify since I saw this movie. I think I've come up with it. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think that this movie is a period piece, mm -hmm. not unlike Amazon's The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Ooh. Uh, it's well shot. Which I just finished. It's a modern style of filmmaking. Um, it's very clean and crisp, very period perfect. They go to great pains to make it look correct. It just feels a little bit too new, mm -hmm. too clean. Mrs. Maisel does or this does? Yes, one? too crisp. And here's the crux. The worst part about The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and why I'm comparing it to Dolomite is My Name is I never find that show funny. Yeah. She's a stand-up comedian. I've never once smirked or chuckled at any of her jokes. The same with Rudy Ray Moore. He had a very distinctive style. In this movie, I was close to when he goes into the theater and watches the movie and can't understand all the raucous laughter around him because he feels a disconnect. I don't know if it's because it's a, a movie about a black actor featuring black actors about uh, black exploitation film, uh, a term that they say, I didn't call it that, but I don't feel connected to this material at all. I don't know that Eddie Murphy, who's a comedic genius and his timing is perfect and he obviously has a massive range, uh, he's believable in dramatic roles, he straddles this strange line of funny but not funny in this movie. It's either a brilliant portrayal of funny but not funny Rudy Ray Moore or Eddie Murphy maybe hitting the wrong tone for this movie and being somewhere in between this character he's playing and the not quite funny sort of restrained Eddie Murphy. Wow. It's difficult to say. Sat through this whole movie on Lance's recommendation, who was in the hospital, and he said that he almost had the doctors rushing in because of spikes on his monitor because he was laughing so hysterically. No way. Yeah. He was like, dude, it's hilarious. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to let that color my experience, but I sat through pretty much stone-faced the whole time. And like Mrs. Maisel, when I started to get a little bit bored or not quite uh, 
invested as invested as I should have been. I just sort of watched what they were doing. Sure. The styles that they made or watching Craig Robinson or anybody like that on the screen who I really enjoy watching. Sure. Having fun making a movie that wasn't necessarily as fun to watch as they had making it. It's a really apt comparison, I think, because Mrs. Maisel has, it is similarly not funny to me, and maybe it is to other people. I'm also struck by how you know differing opinions are on some of these things. I was talking to my sister-in-law about Peter Butter Falcon. She was like, mm, B minus. I was like, what? Yeah, the Academy feels the same way. It's just such a reminder how I think my opinion is so obvious, but it's really, it's really very much my own. But. I adore Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. It's so well done, so beautifully done. That the characters are so delightful. I love their their banter and the repartee. But um, she's not necessarily funny. And I always just kind of chalk it up to, well, comedy is like, it's a live thing. You gotta be in the room. I think that everybody involved in both the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and Dolomite Is My Name are extremely capable. Everyone across the board. Right? And in that way, it comes across almost like stagecraft, where there's never a full immersion and a suspension of disbelief where you believe that he is that character. It just sort of is marveling at the technical skill. It's like Celine Dion, uh, a lot of technical skill. Uh, she's a great singer with very little depth and very little uh, emotional impact for me. Hmm. I'm comparing Dolomite is, not, is My Name to the whitest possible things. <laughs> is Jewish white? Is that bad? Is Jewish white? I don't see. The, I don't know these things. I mean, I mean, um, Rachel Brosnahan's very white. <laughs> so, what do you think "Dolomite is my name" means for Craig Brewer and Eddie Murphy's return to Coming to America? Coming to America was directed by John Landis. John Landis is a good director. Hasn't done a lot since. Craig Brewer, if Dolomite is my name is any, any indication, may not be the right person. I think that Eddie Murphy obviously is pretty consistent. You know what an Eddie Murphy role will be, generally speaking. I guess you could say the same thing about Jim Carrey and then he will surprise you. But I think the successes of Eddie Murphy are in how he's reined in, how he's presented, how he's directed because I think Eddie Murphy, as I said, comedic genius, particularly in short form comedies, in sketch form, or if he plays a rounded dramatic role like he did in Beverly Hills Cop, or if he's a character the entire way through in Raw, which is stand up and which is meant to hit for the laughs. Whereas Dolomite is my name, where it alter alternates between a drama and a comedy, but he's, he's at the Eddie Murphy level the whole time. Like right. it gets a little bit exhausting and isn't it never really achieves, it plateaus and never really achieves the highs of Eddie Murphy's comedy potential. I, I'm not sure how it's going to go. I will definitely be there for coming to America too. Right. Absolutely. Um, I'm not sure if Craig Brewer is the, is the right person. Is he the one who directed Hustle and Flow? Yep. Um, I like that movie for what it was worth. I wouldn't have said, you know what this dude needs to do is come into America. I wouldn't have said that. So we'll see how it goes. Benefit of the doubt, but not a given. Yeah, it's tough for me because second to having seen Raw a dozen times in my life, I've probably seen Golden Child and Coming to America as many times, if not more. Yeah, but would you have said, you know who should direct the darkest Joker movie? The guy who did The Hangover? <laughs> we'll see. Maybe he'll surprise us. So overall, Dolomite is my name is a fairly linear story, right? It takes us across the period, the, the rise of um, Rudy Raymore as his newfound character, and um, it ends with the culmination of his uh, of his masterpiece, um, Dolomite, the film. And along the way, we kind of meet these colorful characters. But I think that um, the very linear nature of this story um, put the burden of all delight and surprise on the characters. And if you weren't invested in the characters, I think they, they, they weren't going to carry it for you. And I was half invested in the characters and therefore only half invested in the film. Was the other half of your investment in the actors? I, I mean, I was invested in watching them and especially Eddie Murphy because I love him. But um, their characters themselves I wasn't fully invested in and because they really bore the brunt of the film, I think that's why the film maybe fell short for me. 
the litmus test would have been if they had cast unknowns and picture-perfect replicas of Rudy Ray Moore, and they went for total authenticity, and he was wearing this actual jacket that the wardrobe people found. He was wearing the same clothes as his character, and we tried to get to look exactly right, and they were unknown actors, as they were for 1917, just to try to fit in and made a really period authentic uh, movie without this cast of stars. Would it have been any good? I wonder. I mean, maybe, especially if I had seen the original Dolomite, like I had seen the original Room, and loved the original Dolomite. Right. I think that this movie is definitely for people who love Rudy Ray Moore, who have fond memories of Dolomite, and want to see an equally fun movie about how it was made. Right. With more contemporary people that they love. Yeah. My other issue with the film was its ending. We had these two repetitive beats with the movie. When he forewalled Dolomite in Indiana, or Indianapolis, um, and then the people showed up. He was like all jazzed and stoked and he, you know, he did it. And then they did the same beat. They repeated the same beat for the premiere. And then they get there and they're surprised and delighted by how, you know, the fans showed up for the premiere. I do like, however, that the way the ending was handled in that the, he wasn't in the movie theater, in the back of the theater, watching people laugh, and then there's the swelling uh, strings and orchestral score where the, he's finally re reached the culmination of his, of his ambitions. Um, but rather, he never even went into the theater. It was outside with a little kid, um, like I said, on the ground, and interacting where the Dolomite movie was secondary, and maybe rightfully so, but Rudy Ray Moore was a character for the people and was outside. So in that way, I see what you're saying. It's a little bit different from Indianapolis, but I wonder how it might have been wrapped up more effectively, aside from what ordinarily might have been them heading toward the lights and the marquee in the distance and then a card talking about how well-received Dolomite was. Um, I think it was a fitting end for the movie, maybe a little bit redundant. It's not something that I thought about before now, but I didn't know where this movie was going to go because while I knew the name Dolomite, I didn't much know much beyond the movie itself going into this movie. Mm. So we talked a lot about how we feel about this film, but what's you know what's your rating? What would you would you recommend it to people? If this movie stood alone in a field outside of the outside of award season, um, it wouldn't have been one that I would have insisted that anybody see. It definitely doesn't deserve, in my opinion, the uh, the recommendation uh, that Lance gave it, saying that it was one of the funniest things he'd ever seen. It's not heart attack inducing funny. All the pieces are in place. This is an all right movie, but it's on the lower end of all right. Uh, about halfway through, I wondered if this movie was ever gonna pick me up in its current, and it did to an extent, but I tended to focus on the non not any Murphy parts. I think the character of Lady Reed, who was Divine Joy Randolph, mm -hmm. may be the strongest character of the movie. Mm. I think she was the most grounded. I think that it was sort of her performance as opposed to the more irreverent stuff. So it's an all right movie. I'm so glad you brought that up because I agree her her character um, next to Rudy Ray Moore or to Eddie Murphy's character uh, are the ones with the arcs. And they're the ones that actually bring heart and, and some depth to the film. And in a way, they make it their film. Just like The Hangover is about a cast of dudes, but really, it's, you're laughing, because I bring it back to The Hangover all the time, um, but really, it's Ed's movie. Ed Helms' movie? Yeah. It's Ed's movie, because Ed is the he's character. He's the soul. With the, he's the one with the arc. Yeah, and he's the one with the beautiful voice. And he has a beautiful voice, yeah. and he's very funny. But he's the one who starts de starts this, you know, um, kind of beaten dog, downtrodden dentist who's completely controlled by his fiance, to a person who actually has thoughts and feelings of his own and wants to exercise those. Yeah, he's a badass. You see that tattoo? <laughs> That's like Hangover Three. This is not to say that anybody in this movie was bad. I think everybody in this movie is capable, down to Craig Brewer, the director. Um, it just never meshed in the way that I hoped it would. Maybe that's my problem with a lot of these movies, is the expectation is set up for it to succeed so wildly, and on paper it does, it just never moves me. Mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying, but I have to say that it's Eddie Murphy that puts this over the edge for me and makes it good. I mean, I, it's a begrudging good, but this movie is good because 
I can't get over the fact that I love Eddie Murphy. There and I think is. I always will. Begrudging good. That's what it should be. Dolomite, begrudging good. That's the name of our podcast. <laughs> that is for the DVD cover. If I That's a quote for the website if I ever saw one. Yep. All right, but that's it for our discussion on Dolomite today. If you want to talk to us about Dolomite, you can email us at orwhatevermovies at gmail.com or call us about whatever. Leave us a voicemail at 818-835-0473. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Thank you. See ya. Hey there, fabulous souls. I'm Stephanie Baklaan. And I'm Eden Alpert. And we're the hosts of the brand new podcast, Unapologetically Fab. Get ready to join us on an amazing and real journey as we dive into life after 40 and own it. We're all about changing the narrative, leaning into who you are, and living a life by your own design. Join us as we embrace life unapologetically and redefine success. This is Unapologetically Fab. An electric cast production. See you there. Electric cast. Are you a fan of classic cinema or a young person who wants to discover the best films of all time? Do these legendary movies still hold up? On the Generation Film Podcast, two guys who grew up when movies dominated the culture share a great film with a panel of young movie lovers and see how it plays for today's generation. We discuss changes in storytelling styles, representation, and the making of each film, its initial reception, and how its meaning has changed over the years. Join us as we explore cinema classics across generations on Generation Film. Electric acid. Electric acid.